Good morning and welcome to Global Perspectives. From our home studios, I'm David Dunkey. And I'm Katie Coronado. Welcome. Today we have the honor of being joined by former U.S. National Security Advisor, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. Thank you for joining us, General. Hey, David and Katie, great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much again. An honor to have you with us, Lieutenant General. We're honored to have you. You're a soldier, you're a historian, a scholar. What makes you proud of what you've done? Well, hey, thanks, Katie. Well, you know, I, I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I, I, from my earliest memory, I wanted to serve in the United States Army. And, and what I'm you know, most proud of, or maybe fond of across my 34 years of service in the Army is I got to, to serve with with courageous, selfless, extraordinary young men and women who were part, who were <laughs> determined to, to protect our nation, um, who would, were willing to make sacrifices for, for missions and endeavors larger than themselves, and who become almost part of a family in which the man or woman next to you is willing to give everything, including their own lives uh, for, for one another. So uh, there are these incredible, you know, less tangible rewards of service that I think a lot of Americans really don't realize. And, and so I, I just consider it the greatest privilege of my life to have served in our, in our army. Thank you for that. You're currently serving as the Fouad and Michelle Ajami uh, Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institute. Um, so you've, you've moved out of, you're out of the military, you're now out of the uh, policy implementing apparatus. You are on, you're frequently on media, you just, you've recently written a book, you write articles. Um, and we want to talk a little about your current book, which is Battlegrounds, for those who haven't read it. Uh, tell us a little about, about this book, why you wrote it. Well, you know, after after 34 years in the army, you know, I I, I made kind of maybe predictably for for an, an army officer a, a mission statement for myself in my second career, and that was to contribute to a better understanding of, of the most significant challenges and opportunities we face internationally, as a way to bring Americans and really citizens across the free world together for meaningful, thoughtful discussions about how we can overcome obstacles and take advantage of opportunities and build a better future for generations to come. And so uh, I undertook this, this book, Battlegrounds, uh, which as I started, I thought, why did I do this? I mean, it's, it's, of course, the scope is very large to, to try to, to write about and foster understanding of, uh, of, the, of the greatest challenges we're facing from you know, great power competition with uh, the Chinese Communist Party and, and with, uh, with Vladimir Putin's Kremlin uh, to the hostile states of Iran and North Korea. Uh, the, the problem of jihadist terrorism centered on the in the geostrategic environments of South Asia and the Greater Middle East, uh, and then and then cross cutting ar arenas of competition involving the interconnected problems of uh, of climate change and environment and energy security and food and water and health security. So, I, I uh, but I, I wound up in a great place here, uh, David, at uh, at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, and I get to work with amazing students uh, who are my research assistants. And we worked on this project for two years together, you know, and and uh, and and I, I hope that it's it's fulfilling its purpose of of generating the discussion of you know about these challenges and opportunities and and, and discussion about how we can build a better future and and uh, and of course I thought I was going to miss one of the, one of the aspects of serving in our army I was going to miss is the opportunity to to serve uh, with young men and women. Uh, but I've been able to do that with, with your work with students here at, at Stanford. And, and I think among young people today, there is really an untapped desire uh, to serve. And so one of the things I've been able to do here is talk with, you know, with students about opportunities to serve in government and you know, outside of government and within the military. Uh, and so it's, it's been extremely rewarding, uh, the, the whole process of writing the book. I don't think I could have done it anywhere else. And I hope it's fulfilling its purpose. There's also some video content, some online content that uh, matches the title of the book. Can you tell us more about that? Because I was watching some and I see that you've interacted with a lot of international figures and it almost seems like it's an opportunity for diplomacy. Can you uh, elaborate? It is. Hey, well, th thanks for that question, Katie. You know, I, 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 one of the themes in the book is, is, is strategic narcissism, and that's meant to really describe our tendency to find the world only in relation to us as Americans, right? And to, and to assume that what we do or decide not to do is decisive toward achieving a favorable outcome. Now, there's a problem with that because it's self-referential, but 
and, and it doesn't acknowledge the degree to which others have agency and influence and, and authorship over the future. So the argument in the book is also for strategic empathy as a corrective to, to this narcissistic view of the world. It's a term I borrowed from the historian Zachary Shore. And, and what, what, uh, what, what uh, Shore says is that we have to pay particular consideration to others' perspectives. We have to view challenges from the perspective of others. And then we also have to pay more attention to the, to the emotions and the aspirations and, and the ideology uh, that, dri that drives and constrains others. And so the, the, the theme of this, the, this, the Battleground series, which, is, uh, which are, are really international perspectives on crucial challenges and opportunities um, that, that we face today, uh, is, to, is to have long format interviews with world leaders. And this is a, it's a video series, and it's also a podcast. But it presents up front the history, really condensed in about six minutes, right? The history of that particular country from which that, that leader is, is coming for the conversation. And then the history of US, uh, the US relationship with that country or with international organizations or whatever the theme is for that week. And then we go into this long format discussion. And it's been really fun. You know, I've invited a lot of old friends that I've made over the years. Uh, and, and many of them are you know, heads of state and foreign ministers and, and, and my, my fellow uh, national security advisors. And, and I, I, it's received you know, some, some, I think, a good response. And, and I really enjoy doing it. And then the other, the other um, video series that I was able to do is under the Policy Ed series here at the Hoover Institution. They do a great job of condensing an understanding of really complex issues into a really digestible, you know, six or seven minute video, and so each part of the each part of the book is reflected in that policy ed video series as, as well. But but again, this is you know this is me moving out on my on my mission statement, right? Is trying to to foster a better understanding of these challenges and opportunities that we face. General, you're, you as a historian, both in this book and in your previous book, have written about some of the American mistakes, and that's of administrations, both Democrats and Republicans. So it's a nonpartisan historical criticism. What do you think, as a historian who's actually worked in the policymaking process, what do you think the United States needs to do to address this strategic narcissism and get to the point of empathy that you, you were just speaking of? Well, thanks, David. You know, in the, in the in the first book I wrote is entitled Dereliction of Duty. It's about it's about how and why Vietnam became an American war. And as I found myself in the job of, of National Security Advisor quite unexpectedly, you know, the president hired me on President's Day 2017. And I went to work in the West Wing of the White House the next day, right? And I didn't even live in Washington. But I, I brought with me, I think, the the experience of of reading, thinking, researching, and writing about how and why Vietnam became an American war. And what I had in mind is to, is to do my best to try to restore uh, a higher degree of strategic competence in the development of foreign policy and national security strategy. And to do that, I thought, okay, well, the first step might be at least avoid making the same mistakes that I wrote about in the book. And, and so I put together a process that would allow us to spend more time thinking about the nature of the challenges we face internationally before rushing to action. We put in place, for example, a what we call a principal small group framing session, quite a mouthful, but but that was that was a discussion organized just around a five page paper that 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 uh, that 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 described the nature of the challenge that we're facing, that identified vital U.S. interests that were at stake, that then took a view of that challenge through the lens of those vital interests, and recommended overarching goals and more specific objectives. We ensured that we identified assumptions, especially assumptions concerning the degree to which we and like-minded partners had agency and influence over this, uh, th this complex challenge. And we identified obstacles to progress and opportunities. And then we stopped there and we had a discussion about that framing. This is, you know, so-called design thinking. Uh, and then we, then, we had, then we talked about ideas, right? Ideas about how to integrate all elements of national power. This is diplomacy, uh, economic policy and, and actions military, uh, law enforcement, intelligence, informational, and so forth, how we integrate those elements of, of power with efforts of like-minded partners to overcome those obstacles and take advantage of opportunities. And those ideas discussed at the cabinet level became kind of really good top-down guidance uh, to, for, for the departments and agencies and our National Security Council staff, whose job it is to, to coordinate and integrate across those departments and agencies to provide best analysis and options to the president. 
And so the system we put in place, part of that system was this, this framing session. Uh, part of it was identifying the, the 16 or so top uh, national security challenges on which we should focus. I think it, it did move us along the direction towards strategic empathy and helped restore a degree of strategic confidence and, 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 uh, and put in place policies and strategies that, you know, that, that could help us understand better how events as they evolve fit into what we're trying to achieve uh, in, in the long term. Uh, some of those strategies survived. Uh, some of those didn't survive the rest of the Trump administration. One that did survive was, I think, probably the most significant shift in U.S. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. And that's the shift in, in policy toward uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And, and, uh, and it's, it's what I describe in the book. It's, it's campaign of, uh, of co-option, coercion, and, and concealment. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we're in Florida, and uh, Cuba also has a communist party and a communist regime. How do you think realistically we can apply this idea of strategic empathy when there are so many differences? You you mentioned you know the communist um, party in China, and earlier uh, you had mentioned Iran uh, during another talk that I heard. Can you tell us more about your take on that? Well, Katie, that's a great question. Overall, I think we are in a competition. I think this, this century will be defined by a competition between authoritarian and closed systems and our free and open societies. Now, now foremost among those are, is the Chinese Communist Party because of the scale, the vastness of the resources that China brings to bear to that competition. But there are others, of course, who are stifling human freedom around the world. And that, that includes the, the Cuban regime, right? And really the Cuban army, which is in control in Cuba. One of the things of which I'm proud is the major shift we affected in the policy toward Cuba when I was national security advisor. And I believe that the Obama administration's approach to, to Cuba was an example of strategic narcissism. Uh, because when you define the world in relation to us, you can define the world as you'd like it to be. And so the way that they, they define the Cuban regime is a regime that would be open, uh, open to, uh, to alternative uh, sources of power and influence developing within Cuba based on the opening to Cuba. The problem here is, is, is the cognitive trap we often fall into, right? Which is mere imaging. This is what we would do. Therefore, this is what you know, maybe the, the, the Castro regime and, and, and its successor would do uh, in, in Cuba. Uh, and, and, then, and then also we fall into cognitive traps associated with optimism bias, right? And, and, uh, and confirmation bias. You know, the image of, of President Obama doing the wave with Raul Castro at a baseball game I think he was pretty optimistic, right, about 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 the nature of that regime. Well, that was that was misplaced optimism. And what we what we endeavored to do when we reassessed our our policy and strategy toward Cuba was to understand the real power structure and the nature of that regime, and to recognize that our opening to Cuba actually had the opposite of the intended effect because the Cuban army is still in charge of the economy. So the, so the economic discourse uh, and, and, and the economic benefits associated with it actually helped the, the, the Cuban army consolidate control and actually gave it more resources, right, to bolster other authoritarian regimes that are stifling human freedom and inflicting great harm on their people. And this, by this, in this case, especially Venezuela, right? And, and so uh, actually, I think the, the Obama administration's policy toward Cuba was well-intentioned but it was in many ways the opposite of what was required. And I think what's required today uh, is a strong policy toward Cuba uh, that, that will only give Cuba economic benefits associated with, with uh, welcoming that, them back into to economic discourse with the United States if that regime really does reform. And of course, what you're seeing in Cuba today, uh, I think in part as a result of the restoration uh, of, of a policy that, that really was aimed to force the Cuban regime to make a choice between continuing its dictatorship uh, or reforming, as you see, I think a real a nascent, uh, louder uh, reform movement uh, within Cuba that, that I hope will ultimately result in the freeing of the Cuban people from the oppression uh, that they've suffered uh, since, the, since the late 1950s, early 1960s. General, I wanted to ask a little about the influence of domestic politics on foreign policy. You know, now that you've worked in the you know, policy-making field. Um, how much of a hindrance is domestic politics on this process? Well, it can be a hindrance. And that, that was one of the main lessons from, you know, from how and why Vietnam became an American war, the story I told in Dereliction of Duty. And, and I, I recap that in the conclusion of, of Battlegrounds and that I was determined to try to insulate the national security 
policy development process, the, the development of options for the president from partisan politics, right? And, and because if, if decisions are made, if options are developed with partisan politics in mind, it could mask the long-term costs and consequences of decisions, and it could foreclose on the president's ability to make the best decision that's in the long-term interests of the American people broadly. Uh, of course, people who are going to advocate for a position based on partisan political con considerations, they will still have a voice, right, as those options go to the president. But I didn't want that to infect the process. So th the way we did this is when we were framing these challenges, whether it was Cuba or Venezuela policy or the China policy or Russia or 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 or, or, this, or what to do about the Syrian civil war, or stabilizing Iraq and defeating ISIS and uh, or or the South Asia strategy centered on the Afghanistan war. What we what we tried to do is bring a broad range of voices in as we developed options for the president. And so on the Cuba issue, for example, uh, our team, I think, did a great job of 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 consulting those in Congress who, who had really a broad range of views on Cuba. Interestingly, they didn't fall out along Democrat Party or Republican Party lines, right? They were there were members of both parties who were for maintaining the Obama administration approach, uh, and there 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 were others across both parties who were for uh, for the, the shift we put in place. So we we did consult those who may have what you could describe as partisan views uh, as part of the process, but we didn't let that infect our decision making process and limit the options that went to the president. You know, when Lyndon Johnson was making decisions on Vietnam, his advisors determined the option they thought he wanted, right, based on his domestic political priorities, and they gave him really only a shined up version of that option. And that was a great disservice to the nation and also to the president. So so um, it's in the presentation of multiple options that you can compare them. You can compare the risks and costs associated with them, the likelihood uh, that, that, they'll, that, they'll, that you'll be able to make progress toward, toward your objectives at an acceptable cost to the American public uh, and the American people. So, so anyway, I, I, did bring, I did bring these lessons of Vietnam with me. And foremost uh, among them was not to allow partisan politics to infect the process and limit the options that are presented to the president. Now, I'll tell you, I mean, uh, David, there's some people who didn't, didn't like that, right? Who, who actually, some people, I think, who serve in any administration aren't there to give the elected president options. They're actually there to try to manipulate decisions consistent with their own agenda, right? So uh, this is one of the reasons why, you know, I, I got used up in, a, in about a 14 month time span as national security advisor. I'd like to go back to the strategic empathy and ask you if you could think of specific examples that didn't work specific to the Middle East, for example. Absolutely. So, 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 it, strategic empathy. I think it, you know one, one of the areas in which we 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 failed to recognize uh, uh, it really uh, the the the, it, the implications of the emotions and aspirations and ideology that drive constraint and the others is with Iran policy. I write about this extensively in the book about how multiple administrations, really beginning with the Carter administration, right after the the Iranian Revolution in 1979, assumed that a conciliatory approach to, toward Iran would moderate the regime's behavior, would, would strengthen moderates wi within that regime uh, and could lead to reforms and, and, uh, and, and lead to a reduction in Iranian behavior that cuts against U.S. interests in the region, especially, uh, especially limiting the violence that Iran exports and the threat that Iran poses to, uh, to its Arab neighbors and, and especially Israel. And, and I write about how every administration, really up to the Trump administration, uh, ha has taken this conciliatory approach in the hope that, 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 that Iran would, would change its behavior. But what, what they undervalued, what each of these administrations undervalued, and I think what the Biden administration is undervaluing today as well, uh, is, is the first of all, the ideology of the revolution and how that ideology drives, drives the regime, drives the regime toward the export of the revolution and this kind of forward defense mentality that the that that the Iranian uh, theocratic dictatorship has um, that is also associated with the desire to establish Iranian hege hegemonic influence over the region, really to be able to have preponder a preponderance say in, in 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 the Middle East, and they're doing this obviously through you know through the the, the second factor that we fail to consider is this four decade long proxy war uh, that Iran has been waging. Uh, against you know the great Satan, the United States, because pushing us out of the region is the first step toward 
achieving uh, its objectives and threatening Israel directly, you know, the little Satan, Israel, uh, and the Arab monarchies. And, and, and we don't consider really how the, the regime is determined to continue to keep the Arab world perpetually weak and enmeshed in conflict by applying kind of the Hezbollah model to the region where they have, as they do in Lebanon, you know, a very weak government in, in power that is somewhat dependent on Iran for support, while Iran grows militias outside of that government's control, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the militias in Syria, the you know the so-called Hashdashabi and, and or, or, or 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 other uh, militias in, uh, in 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 Iraq, uh, the Houthis in Yemen, but they can be turned against the government if that government acts against Iranian interests, and and this is what's generating this humanitarian catastrophe centered on the Syrian civil war, and we don't consider it. We, we so we don't we don't actually view the the problem set in the region from the perspective of the Iranians. And, and therefore, I think the Obama administration made the grave mistake of thinking that this Iran nuclear deal, right, and, and again, similar to the assumptions made about Cuba, and welcoming Iran back into the international order would lead to a, not only a moderation in its, in its behavior, but a transformation, like in the very nature of the regime. I mean, and I think, sadly, the Biden administration is, is resurrecting the same flaws of the, of the Obama administration toward Iran. And I think that's probably the, one, of, that's one of the most dramatic examples in the book. And I could talk more about Afghanistan as well as, I think, a, you know, a, a, a major example of strategic narcissism. On Iran, uh, you joke in the book about my Iran, as opposed to Iran. Uh, we want to pronounce things even how we want to pronounce them rather than how they should be pronounced. But I, what do we do to, to actually change the situation, especially right. when we look next door at an example like Iraq? where we actually did have a regime change and had a, a great deal of hubris in what would come next. Yeah, I, I think I think what makes sense is to is to is to uh, develop a policy, and this is what I argue for the book, and the title of the chapter is called Forcing a Choice, that forces the Iranian leadership to make a choice of either you know behaving like a, a normal responsible nation uh, and stopping its support for terrorist organizations and militias that are have created or perpetuating this humanitarian catastrophe across the region, um, uh, or uh, or suffering the consequences of economic isolation, but not allowing them to have it both ways. I mean, the sad part about the JCPOA is the JCPOA allowed them to have it both ways. As soon as those restrictions were lifted and we, we had a big cash payoff as part of this toward the Iranians, the Iranians immediately uh, increased their stipend to Hezbollah by 700 million dollars and gave $100 million to Hamas in, in Gaza. And we've seen what Hamas has done with that, not only with that money, but the Iranian provided rockets, almost 4,000 of which uh, they just fired at, at, uh, at Israeli civilians. So I, I think there is a connection there, right, between, you know, between uh, the, the JCPOA and the sanctions relief and the proxy wars that, are, that Iran is fighting. So, hey, let's force them to make a choice and it would be the overall approach. Now, it's going to be tougher to do because China now is buying you know, a million barrels of oil a day from Iran. Uh, and, and so the, the trends are in the wrong direction. But I think alleviating the pressure would be the wrong choice. Now, to answer your question about regime change, yes, we should want the regime to change, not in a 2003 Iraq, us imposing a change, but to put in place a policy that encourages the Iranian people over time to affect a change in the Iranian government such that it ceases its permanent hostility to the United States, Israel, and its Arab uh, neighbors, and, and the West broadly. And I think that makes sense to do it. And we ought to evaluate the specific aspects of a policy based on whether it contributes to or detracts from that long-term goal. So that, that's what I would argue the policy would be yes for regime change over time, because <laughs> this regime has proven you know, over, over the years with you know, bombings over marine barracks, uh, and our, and our embassy in Lebanon in 1983, you know, the, you know, the attacks on U.S. naval vessels in, in, in the Gulf, the attacks on U.S. forces in, in Africa and, and across uh, the Middle East, the bombing of Cobar Towers in, in, uh, in, in, um, in, in Saudi Arabia, the killing uh, through their proxies of over 600 American soldiers uh, in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I think the, 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 the regime has demonstrated its permanent hostility, and it's only logical for us to put in place a policy that would want it to evolve away from that permanent hostility.
there are probably many people watching and um, some of those people may want to become you in the future. To wrap it all up, you're a leader and I want to know and they may want to know what it has taken in a nutshell to do everything that you have done and overcome challenges with international conflicts. What can you say has been uh, what has kept you going? Yeah. Well, I, I think I drew strength from the from the extraordinary people that I got to serve with over the years. And, and I, I drew strength from uh, my fellow servicemen and women who I had the, the, the opportunity to serve with, but then also my partners internationally as well. And, you know, I think oftentimes these days, you know, we are driven toward discussions that that, that about what divide us, right? What, uh, you know, what our, what our very specific identity category is and how that makes us different from one another. But, but, you know, Katie, what I, what really I drew strength from uh, across my career was our common humanity. And, you know, we think about long service in the army as a service associated with being a warrior. And that's true. But I think our warriors today are also humanitarians who do demonstrate tremendous empathy for others and build working relationships across the world that cut across cultures, right? Because ultimately, don't we all kind of want the same thing? Don't we want a better world for our children? And, and so I, th I think that whereas we have to be sensitive, right, to cultural differences and perspectives uh, in, in the world, we also ought to not mask our common humanity and how we can work together to build a better future. General H.R. McMaster, thank you so much for being on our show today. Thank you for your service in and out of uniform. We appreciate it. And hey, what a pleasure to be with both of you. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week on another episode of Global Perspectives. Mm -hmm.